Welcome everybody to this webinar. Is it time for universal school meals? Um, this is being hosted on behalf of the organizations that you can uh, see here, uh, Sustain and Children's Food Campaign, Sustainable Food Places, Chefs in Schools, Soil Association Food for Life, School Food Matters, Bite Back 2030, the Food Foundation, and we've also had a lot of support from four London boroughs and the Child Poverty Action Group, and so thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got about 70 people online at the moment, um, so there's still people joining as we speak. Um, as you join, please feel free, um, as you will be able to see at the bottom of your screen, two functions. One says chat. Um, please do use the chat throughout this webinar to um, share your thoughts. Uh, to share information. Um, and there's also a Q&A button, and please use that to ask questions to the panelists as we uh, go through. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, you are all automatically muted, uh, so hopefully uh, that won't be a problem. And uh, none of your videos will appear on screen, so none of you will appear. If, however, you do want to speak as part of the discussion later, um, if you signal uh, through uh, the, the chat function uh, to the to the organizers, then uh, you will be able, we can promote you and then you would appear in a recording. Um, but apart from that, you're all um, perfectly safe. Um, so I am going to uh, pass without any further ado to uh, the organ to our chair for the day. Uh, let me just move this on. Hold on, my PowerPoint isn't there. There we go. Um, please do tweet uh, throughout uh, the, this webinar. Um, I've, the hashtag is Universal School Food. You can see uh, the tags of the organizers here, but also as we go through the panelists, you'll be able to uh, see their tags on Twitter. And so please do use their tags and use the hashtag Universal School Food. So, uh, Without any further ado, I'm going to pass to Raksha Mystery, uh, who is the regional manager for the Soil Association Food for Life program. She's going to introduce herself. But uh, one thing I would say is we're really delighted that uh, Raksha, as a new trustee of SUSTAIN, um, has agreed to chair this webinar. So over to you, Raksha, for the rest of this webinar. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks. It's great to be invited to chair. Hi, everyone. So as uh, Barbara has said, um, I'm Raksha Mystery and I'm the programme manager in Leicestershire uh, and, and co-trustee at Sustain. So for the last seven years, um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, for the last seven years, I've been working uh, for the County Council team, tackling being part of the obesity work that the public health leads to really bring about a good culture of good food across the county as part of the Food for Life Awards that you might be aware of. So when I began the role, um, Universal Infant Free School Meals actually um, had just began and I've now been working with over 200 schools and caterers and communities really to tackle food poverty and to increase the uptake of school meals. And during these years, I've seen a real transformation taking place working firsthand with families and schools on some of the challenges. And so, we're here um, to support the caterers to really attain higher good quality food standards, um, championing sustainable food and the local food economy, and really trying to ensure the productivity of our land through um, Food for Life Served Here Award. Now, the recent COVID-19 pandemic has really exposed and exacerbated levels of food insecurity for millions of households in the UK. And according to child poverty groups, two in five children are living in households below the poverty line and who are not eligible for free school meals. And at the same time, the government has set out an ambitious target to halve child obesity levels by 2030. So that's less than nine years away. And evidence suggests that children who take up school meals are more likely to eat a high proportion of fruit and veg. And this is certainly the case as I've seen. But as we've also seen, sometimes packed lunches, they are, they're only they're quite nutritionally deficient in many cases with only one to two percent of packed lunches meeting the nutritional school food standards. So we're at a really critical point in time to make a real difference. The national food strategy has called for free school meals to be expanded to all children from households in receipt of universal credit. 
but today we'll be hearing from Scotland um, who've already gone a step further and are committed to expanding the free school meals and breakfasts and lunches for all primary school children for, from 2022, including during school holidays. And they're also pilot the universal breakfast pilot program in secondary schools. So there's huge changes happening there. So the issues around free school meals today are really multifaceted. And as we emerge out of COVID-19 with this new challenge, we also have an opportunity to rethink, review what's best for our children, our families, our health, our environment, our economy, as we look to build back better. So we're really excited about today's event um, to hear from our speakers and to, to take forward um, the, the the conversations around these issues. So we welcome everyone uh, to, to take part. Like Barbara said, don't forget to join in with the hashtag Universal School Food and our supporters. So I would like to introduce you now to Christine um, from Bite Back, Christine Adain, um, who will be joining us uh, to really start a conversation off from with the views of our young people. So over to Christine, thank you. So uh, Christina was um, actually not able to join us in live today, um, but she has sent us a video. Um, so that's what I'm about to show you. And we also have a video from some other young people. And um, so we're, hopefully you can all hear this. Shout in the chat if you can't. It's just over one year on from my free school meal petition calling on the government to provide a permanent solution for free school meal provision in the holidays for the 1.4 million eligible children. It was incredible to see the government U-turns and the campaigning that followed. The collective effort that put free school meals front and centre in so many people's minds who had never probably thought about it before, that's the kind of solidarity we need to keep up as we continue to push for more improvements. The past year has shown me that we can get the government to listen to us on this issue, especially when young people raise their voice. But it's also made clear that the free school meal system still isn't totally fixed. I'm here to represent the youth voice and share some of the powerful stories I've heard speaking to my peers and fellow youth board members. The stories that stand out to me the most are the ones that are so common amongst students on free school meals having to choose between a hot meal and a drink or snack at break time because they're hungry and then sacrifice their lunch and being forced to let people know that they're on free school meals when on school trips. We even had our own youth board member that wasn't getting her full £2.20 and that only changed for students on free school meals at her school when she brought it to attention, to the attention of a teacher. Finally, Barbara asked me to share what my vision for healthy school food would look like for all. Universal Meals for All will eliminate stigma and help us improve the quality of food for all. More equal provision across all schools so that food isn't a lunchtime lottery based on what school you go to, and an end to the profiting off of school meal provision so that everybody is incentivized to prioritize child health. Thank you again to Stain for hosting this really important conversation today. I'm looking forward to seeing what we can all accomplish together next. And uh, through the Food Foundation, um, as well as Christina, uh, we had had a, a video sent to us also uh, from Beth, who is one of the Children's Right to Food Ambassadors uh, from North Wales and one of the people that took part in the Children's Future Food Inquiry that has called for a, 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 a big um, campaign to enshrine the children's right to food, but also to address uh, health inequalities across um, school food and uh, access to children's food and this is in a few parts so we'll hopefully this will work. Hi my name's Beth, I live in North Wales and I've been a Food Foundation Food Ambassador for three years. That in the short term the government should increase eligibility for free school meals at the moment, when someone is on free school meals, there is a massive stigma and there's lots and lots of studies and even people in uh, myself and people in, in schools can tell you that if someone is on free school meals, they are seen as as different 
to everyone else and you shouldn't be able to see income within students we should all just be as equals so if if everyone were to have state funded school meals then there would be there wouldn't be this divide and i feel as if well when you go to school you have everything else provided for you you're at the same level as everyone else but it has to be different for meals when it shouldn't be Thanks. Thanks, Barbara, for oh, Sorry, there's one more bit. I do bit. believe that there has been an increased awareness of the issue of food, especially the children, but that's for it not for positive reasons, although it does have a positive outcome. Um, with COVID, we all know that it's impacted everyone, but especially on food. And when there's been schemes that have failed in children not being able to get food, it's obviously brought media attention. And obviously, because we've been campaigning about this for three years, it's been good for our campaign. But we really need to strike while the iron's hot now. Everyone knows that food is an issue within our society and how people can't access it. But there's no point having all this attention for then nothing to happen. So what has affected my right to food is that I'm happy that there's lots and lots of more people aware of it but now that we've got that back in we need to do something about it. So from the Covid pandemic we all know how much of an issue food has been for everyone but it's not just individual cases that you hear on the news unfortunately it is a vast majority of people and it's come to the point where we've had to have celebrity campaigners to even inflict change within the government. What I would like to see is that the government recognises how much of a widespread issue it is and how their actions now can change people's lives. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today, although I couldn't speak in person because I had school, but um, I'd just like to say that if anyone wants any more information, please, please, please refer to our charter. There's so much in there that goes way more in depth than I have today. And we think that that could really inflict some good and positive policy change. Some striking perspective. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's great to hear the views from, from those that really matter and their perspectives of school food. Um, I'd like to introduce now Rima G. Reed from uh, a school leader at Hollidale School who's really at the front end and, and looking at the impact of, of school meals and how it's making a difference to families. So over to you, Rima. Is Rima there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Rima G. Thank you. Um, Bob, you going to present? I think Bob is going to present my slides. Okay, hi. So my name's uh, Rima G. Reed. I'm head teacher at Hollydale Primary School. I've been here since 2013. And Hollydale is, thank you, Barbara, the next slide. Hollydale is a school in, in the London borough of Southwark. And it's quite a deprived borough in certain parts. So for us, there's 40% of children that have free school meals. And 10% of those children bring packed lunch. 30% um, of our parents receive universal um, credits and the school has high mobility. SCN is 19%, 50% EAL. And regardless of income, our parents receive, all of our children receive universal free school meals. And as well as that in Southwark, you have the healthy free school meals offer. So for children who are in year three to six. So everyone in Southwark, regardless of uh, class, whatever else you get, you get fed. Thank you, Barbara. So for me, I've got a particular interest in food because I started out as a senior meal supervisor many years ago when I had young children and needed to work. And was always on the forefront of looking at what children eat and was always kind of fascinated by the fact that children were fed. At the time, many years ago, the food wasn't great, but the key thing was, is that the children were having a hot meal during the school day. Thank you, Barbara. So really, as you said, before um, moving forward, before COVID, there were lots of food insecurities, which is what Raksha was talking about. And you can see from the data here that um, free school meal children were always at the fore of that insecurity, um, food insecurity. 
and food that wasn't as nutritious. And even at times they were hungry and they were the ones that were using food banks mainly, but there's other groups as well that were accessing those food, um, that food insecurity as well. Thank you, Barbara. So the fact is with Hollydale, we've found that food poverty, there's been a lot of stress on parents in terms of food. The fact that the lockdowns lasted so long, it meant our parents had to find money to feed their children, not necessarily nutritious, but they needed to feed their children when they weren't at school. There was um, a network, a sort of a safety net there where we gave out food vouchers and different things were happening during the lockdown. But also the challenge for us was that there were lots of families because of the furlough, low income families that were having issues around feeding their children. They weren't really, that was a group that was kind of missed by the government because they were working parents, but not very highly paid. But what happened was it brought to the fore the issues around food poverty for those families. Thank you, Mother. So for us, we were featured an article in The Guardian where this particular family here was a low income family. So they, free, they were receiving the universal free school meals and were doing very well. However, when they went into lockdown, they were not given, um, um, they didn't have as much food as possible. So for us, there was that safety net there of school food matters that supported that cause there. But they really benefited from the universal free schools uh, provision or such families. So I've put the link up there. So anybody who wants to take a look at that article, very interesting and it will give you a little bit more insight into our school. Thank you. So we found that at Hollydale, we are a very deprived school. And what it is, is that universal free school meals boosts health and impacts on attainment, as we all know. So Raksha and the other young people have said exactly what I'm saying here. And we, we try to teach our parents and our children that food should sustain you, it should help you grow, and it should repair. So it's really important that it's healthy food, not any type of food, but we try to push here with our parents just about the fact that our free school meals are very, very healthy. And there was one slide I wanted to put in was a menu which shows you the food that is on offer at Hollydale via the universal free school meals. Thank you, Barbara. So with the universal free school meals provision, we work with um, catering, but I'm very, very, very much of a helicopter on what they're feeding our children. So as I said, at this school, um, it's about one size doesn't fit all. It's that uh, we have lots of children from different cultures. So we, I talk to the chefs and say, look, it's about sometimes giving food that children will enjoy, giving them opportunities to try new food. So I work with the catering company with the menus. The key thing being that all the food is nutritious. And the aim of us, the aim at the school is that it's about lifelong love, lifelong love of good food. So not just any food, but good food. So there's lots of, lots of opportunities to experience different food. For example, thank you, Barbara, we have theme days. So this is an example of a universal free school meal offer where it was Black History Month, but the children were given the opportunity to have a Nigerian menu. So it was jollof rice with brown rice, uh, beans and salad and planting, which is also introducing different cultural foods to those families. And of course, some ginger cake and ice cream. But again, the universal free school meals, yes, it is an offer, but it's an offer that for our school is very much monitored and it, make, it ensures that the children have a variety of quality first foods. Thank you. So as well as that, food at Hollydale is really important. So beyond the free school meals um, offer, we work with a project called the Felix Project, which um, gives us free food every week. Um, and it's about from the food bounties, food that would otherwise be disposed of, they deliver it to our school. And it's all really good food, fruit, vegetables, um, rice, pastas and everything else. And we distribute that to that parent. So there's that continuum of good food that is permeating Hollydale School and supporting them. Um, thank you, Barbara. We also work with Greg's Foundation. So our children start the day with a healthy breakfast. Uh, they fund our um, 
um, they fund our breakfast club so the children get brown bread only, water, they don't have orange juice, and lots of healthy food to start the day as well. Thank you, Barbara. So we also work, as you know, with School Food Matters. So for us, it was the kids are at school, what could we do whilst they was uh, on holiday? So working with School Food Matters was amazing that we knew that our children were experiencing healthy food with menus as to how, and recipes as to how to use it. Um, and so the key thing at Hollydale is about education, food being quality food permeating these children's lives at all times, not just when they're at school, and that when parents are thinking about what foods they're giving them when they're at home. So all of those organizations have been really, really supportive and beneficial to our families. Thank you, Barbara. So last but not least, it's about educating about food. So what we do is we have our children in year four upwards, we adopt a chef and they come in and they work with our children to show them how to cut up fruit and vegetables, you know, to have taste the sessions of vegetables and fruit that they've probably never tasted, how to cut these foods up and prepare it. Some of these children are better at um, cutting up onions than I am. So it's about the core being, the vision of the school being um, is that every child learns about food and they understand that quality food is what makes a difference to their lives. Thank you. So last but not least, we support the whole school approach for universal free school meals. I don't think I'd be happy to run a school if there were children that were not being well fed. So it's about equality of good food for all. It's about food education through eating well at school. You know, those children are learning when they get, a, they get the opportunity to eat salad, they get the opportunity to have fruit. They understand that it's not about cake and custard every day. And they understand that food sustains you, grows and repairs the body. Therefore, it needs to be nutritious. And that is regardless of income. And that's the key thing. When you work in inner city schools for as long as I have, it's got to be about equality for all and not just about those that can afford it. Because what you're doing, as the young lady said, it's about that stigma. It's about that divide. It's about the have and the have nots. And at Hollydale, what you see is that everybody works together. This is about educating all. And it should not be a privilege to eat well. And we have found over the many years is that it's related to attainment and brain function. When you eat well at Hollydale, there is no reason for my children not to do well, because I said, have you had breakfast? Let's, if not, go downstairs, let's get you something to eat so you can start the day well. So the vision is that every child learns about food in a holistic sense and has the confidence to eat well. And so I am really an advocate for universal free school meals and for schools like Hollydale, the whole of the community is grateful for the fact that, our, that the children are being fed, but not just fed, but fed well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eve. That's it's It's fantastic to hear how you're really supporting the children across the board with the whole settings approach, whole school approach, but also really developing, you know, conscious consumers for the future. Um, we do have uh, a couple of questions coming up, but we please do continue add adding the questions to the chat and uh, we will pick these up um, after we've also heard from Andy. So let me introduce you to Andy Gold, who's Head of Food Strategy at Public Health, London Borough of Newham. Over to you, Andy. Hello, Barbara, are you going to do my one slide or shall I do it? We, we never agreed this. I, I'm going to do my own slide. Is that? Oh, no, I'm not. Barbara, will you do my slide? There we go. Um, I hope you can all see that. I know we've got some sort of uh, wandering black box issues based on the uh, the chat, but um, not to worry. I'm going to going to talk through everything on the screen and we'll um, and we'll see where we get to. So, hi, I'm uh, I'm Andy Gold. I'm the head of food strategy at London Borough of Newham. Um, I, I work in public health, but my work is all across the council. And I think um, before we kind of dive into our universal primary free school meals offer, I think it's really important to say that a new food is a really big deal in lots of areas. So we're going to talk about why we think a universal primary free school meal offer is so important at Newham. But it's really important to put that in the context of the fact that we think the big issues on health and well-being, on educational attainment and on community wealth building are all things that need action. And it's not that we do this instead of those things. Does that make sense? I've only got a few people on screen, but do nod. And hopefully one of you. There we go, Cecily. Um, so the first statistic when we think about, oh, and the other thing I should say is we are one of four boroughs in, um, 
in England that offer a universal primary free school meals offer. And by that, I mean, we've obviously, like everybody, got the universal infant free school meals offer, which covers reception year one and year two. And then we as a council fund years three to six. And the scheme you're looking at today means that every primary school in Newham gives their children a meal every lunchtime. So we call our scheme in Newham Eat for Free uh, for fairly obvious reasons. And the key statistic that we begin with when we look and we evaluate the scheme is that in Newham, 90% of children at Key Stage 2, over 90%, I should say, have a school meal every day. Now, when you think as a, a former teacher myself, and there's going to be lots of teachers on this call, that you never have more than about 90 something percent of children in school. Effectively, we have every child every day engaging with a school meal at lunchtime. And the reason why we begin there is because before we began this scheme, we had about 45 percent of children engaging with a school meal every day. So, you know, less engaging than were, sorry, more not engaging than engaging. Uh, and compared to a, a, a comparator borough today, they, they, they would get about 50 to 60 percent engagement when you look around. Uh, and, you know, 56 percent of all children eating a meal and we have over 90 percent. Now, that's really, really important because the things I'm going to talk about today all fundamentally from a local authority point of view, boil down to if you can't get the young people engaged in this, you cannot tackle these big and otherwise very, very expensive issues. So the first reason we think a universal primary free school meals offer is so important in Newham is you're getting school food, you're getting good food on the curriculum every day. Um, I didn't catch the name of the second young person to speak, Barbara. I don't know if you can shout her out, but um, she, she put it really well. In no other area of education do we expect to affect major change and not have it central and core to the curriculum. You know, we don't have 99% literacy because some of the kids uh, choose to do English and some of the kids we ask them if their parents would like to pay and they'd like to join in. So it's on the curriculum, it's there every day. And it means that as we look at huge issues like obesity, oral health or food security, which lots of you who work within London will know is a particularly big issue in Newham that we've had to tackle through the pandemic and before, every child engaging every day, every school, 66 primary schools. So it's central to what everybody's doing at the same time every day. Now, obviously we know that by getting every child to eat a school meal, that means less packed lunches. Now we all know that only about 1.6% of packed lunches meet the very basic school food meal standard. Now in Newham, that's even less relevant or even more important perhaps because we, have, we insist on a very high quality meal that is certified and inspected. Lots of you will be familiar with the Soil Association Food for Life. Now, through our scheme, we have a grant condition that requires every school when spending that universal primary free school meals money, that eat for free money, to have their meals at a certified bronze standard. Now, lots of you will be aware that government school meal standards are no longer inspected by Ofsted or by anybody else. So one of the benefits of the scheme and the way we run it is that grant condition means you have a meal at a higher standard and it's being inspected. Um, then the last thing from a health and wellbeing point of view is that we have grant conditions. and. We introduced these not long before the pandemic. For several years, we'd run this scheme. About the first seven years we ran this scheme, the big focus was on performance and entertainment that I'll get to next. But we realized we had a huge opportunity with the grant and with the grant conditions to say to all schools, it's not just about that healthy meal in the middle of the day. We want all 66 schools, please, to engage in whole school health programs. And effectively, we wrote into the grant that supports the meals. We want everyone to see this meal as a giant tea on which you put the topic of healthy food, and health and tea off from it. So we've got all 66 schools participating and lots of those schools choose a specific focus on food, but for others it's particular areas of health around that. Now we're all familiar with the arguments around education, probably in feeding children. These are as old as Fred Jowett and the suffragette Margaret Macmillan doing the first meals in 1879. And we all know this to be universally true, that when you feed people properly, they achieve their peak performance. Now, if anybody doubts this, I suggest we stop this meeting now and we come back tomorrow at three o'clock and I'm not gonna give half of you lunch and I'm not gonna give a quarter of you any breakfast either and we'll see how we do. And we all know the answer to this. Now, the data shows us that there's a, an increase in performance entertainment in our borough versus a comparator that doesn't have this scheme and that it is most marked amongst pupils of greatest disadvantage. Now. I used to be a teacher. I know there's going to be lots of teachers on this call. Long before cycling was cool, I used to think of my class as a peloton. And you've got those students up the front that are riding very strongly, but you've got those that are really trying to hang on the back. And the basic rule of all professional cycling is they all eat really, really well to stay together as a group. And 
It's something that's very, very striking that again, you're all doing the same thing at the same time. And all of those kids, you know, are turning up in the afternoon well fed. And the teachers feed this back to us. We did our consultation this year. And while not all teachers feel you can pull out and, and say, right, it's definitely this. We had around 40% of teachers saying, yes, this is definitely something that makes a difference to concentration to what you see. Um, and I think the last thing on this that's quite interesting, and it's something that came back this year in our consultation and feedback with parents, is obviously not having to prepare packed lunches. And if you've got 50% of your children having packed lunches, that's 50% of your parents. You've got more time at home with your kids. You've also got something we found this year that you've got something in the healthy food arena to go home and talk about as parents and children. And you've got the children exporting something from school back into classes. Now with my local government hat on, where this gets really, really interesting, really, really exciting is around the industry of school meals and school meals in your borough. So school meals are a really big industry in you. And we're a big borough. We're 400,000 people. So if we were a city, we'd be, I don't know if anyone's here from Nottingham, but I always think of you, Nottingham, because I used to live there. And no one thinks of Newham as a city, but it's a big city, a bit like the size of Nottingham. 80% um, of the people who work in our primary schools, in our school meals industry generally, 80% of those people, actually, sorry, 86%, are Newham residents. So you're talking about an industry that feeds our children and employs the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the grandparents, the brothers and sisters of those children. Now, our scheme, we have a grant condition that asks all schools to pay a real London living wage and uh, local government pensions when they are um, going out to tender for their contracts for their catering. Now that's really, really important because obviously you are putting money into the pockets of the parents, the grandparents, the guardians, the brothers and sisters of the children in our primary schools. Um, you've obviously got a very, very direct benefit to the uh, Newham economy. Uh, you've got those wages, you've got those wages going back into the economy and not leaving the borough through a press down on wages and terms and conditions as corporate profits. In effect, all the money we're putting into school meals is doing one of two things, isn't it? It's paying the people that produce them, or it's going into the quality of the meals itself, which is really, really important because I think lots of people on this call would agree that the goal of spending public money in this, this arena is not to see the maximum profits generated, but to see the maximum investment in children. So that grant condition has been really, really important. Uh, the other area where it's important by having a certified standard, and we need to thank the Soil Association for their work on this, uh, you know, helping us enforce that, you are able to ensure that the companies or company more or less in our case delivering those school meals is not able to force down on quality and standard because we know what that means like a great metric is about 16 or 18 plates per hour of work from somebody engaged in the school meals industry now obviously if you increase that to 22 24 26 plates per hour by decreasing the quality of the meals decreasing the amount of work going on on site increasing the freshness much more pre-packed well obviously you cut down on two things one how rewarding that career is. You cut down secondly on the amount of high quality food work being seen in, in the schools, but you also ultimately cut down on jobs. You cut down on rewarding careers that are happening in your borough. Um, and then the last couple of things to sort of very quickly move on to, we have all 66 schools moving along together because of this universal offer in this grant. As a consequence, it opens up all kinds of exciting conversations. Um, and then the only other thing I'd say is, again, with our, our local economy hat on, You've got that reinvestment potential because we have local government pension and real London living wage baked into every tender. It means the only thing those contracts really should be tendered on is the quality of the school meals. Unsurprisingly, you find that those contracts are often won by Juniper Ventures, our local school meals caterer who really know the landscape. They really know, know our borough and our borough is a real and unusual place, like probably lots of people on this call. Their place is very different to others. And as a consequence, what you have is either money spent on meals, money spent on the terms and conditions of rewarding employment, or if there is any surplus generated, it comes back in either to reinvestment locally in school meals or back to the council. Um, this approach is very, very interesting in terms of what we now see. We put in about 5.89 million um, as a council in order to fund key stage two meals, but it anchors, those of you who are familiar with community wealth building and the concept of anchoring, it anchors 14 million pounds being spent in the way I've described, being spent at real London living wage, being spent at LGPS, being spent on certified meals. So although we have to put in a good chunk of money, it turns even more money into something we can tangibly see. Um, Hi, Andy. Andy, that's 
absolutely fantastic. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there just so that we can come back to some of the questions. But the social return on investment that you've highlighted is, is phenomenal. Um, thank you very much for all the information that you've you've shared with us. Hopefully we'll be able to pick some of this up in the questions and answers that have also already started to come through. So um, without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll go to the questions. Thank you everyone for submitting your, your questions. Uh, please do keep them coming. Obviously, please do also continue uh, tweeting and using the hashtag that we have for the event universal please call me, uh, Universal School Food, I should say. And uh, yeah, so the first one comes uh, is, comes from School Food Maths. Thank you very much. This is for Rima. Um, the question is, if you didn't have the support of uh, London Borough Southwark to feed Key Stage 2, what percentage of families do you think would have struggled to pay for a school meal? Um, I would say probably at Hollydale, I would say the area, um, are probably about 60 to 70% of um, which is quite sad, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge proportion. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, and another one, Rima, this is from Healthy Schools. So, um, Rima, it sounds like you're doing a fantastic job. Do you, use the, do you use a catering provider or do you use an on-site team that prepares the meals? So, um, Healthy Schools are working in North Nottinghamshire, North Northamptonshire Council, I should say, and have four out of five main catering providers. However, they've been recently getting feedback on really poor, unhealthy options. And we don't know where to start tackling and questioning them as they're such a large corporation. So do you have any advice for them? We, we have a, a catering company that works with us, which initially was really quite poor. But when I decided that I'd call the plug, they decided to pull up their ideas. Uh, the food was, and we have an on-site chef that comes in and I work with her. And as I said, because of the knowledge and experience I have of food in schools, we, the menus are sent to me and I look over and I say, no, that's not good enough. That So it's about building that relationship with the caterers. And if they're not prepared to meet you halfway, because you as the head teacher, you know your school community, you know what they need. And so those catering companies you need to understand that we, I, I'm the expert and so it's about working closely with me and and just, just following on from that um how would you encourage other head teachers to to actually see food as a passion as you do um well i'm in that dining hall every day <laughs> so i don't i don't usually eat after four o'clock so i eat the, the food that i eat at school is my main meal so for me it's about really the children seeing you in the dining hall eating that food as well and enjoying it but taking an interest and normally head teachers are bogged down at lunchtime. So you don't always know what's going on in the dining hall, but it's having that active, visible interest. And I see the catering staff as my staff. They work for the catering company, but when they're on site, they're working for me. They know my standards. So it's about actively getting involved and making sure, as Andy said, that the the food, there's a food curriculum that's going on in your school. You're talking about it all the time. You're working with these great companies like S School Food Matters, a doctor chef. So at Hollydale, food is an important part of what we do, but they know it all starts with me um, being the mother of four and, and, being, and, being, and making sure that I eat my school dinner, which is my main meal. So it needs to have all those different nutrients going on. So what I eat is what they eat. Brilliant. OK, thank you. Uh, we are going to have to uh, move forward on to our next uh, presentation from Birgit and uh, Rabe and Angus Holford from the University of Essex. However, we have there are numerous questions that have come in on the chat and we will endeavour to pick these up uh, throughout the session later today. Over to you, uh, Birgit and Angus. Okay. Could you unshare so I can share my own ones and be in control? Thank you. OK, so I hope everyone can see that. OK, um, there we go. Yeah. So just to introduce ourselves, uh, Begita Raba, my colleague, and I are both labour and education economists at the Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex. And I'm pleased to talk today about results from our Nuffield Foundation funded research project on the impacts of the universal infant free school meal policy in England. 
So our approach is entirely with secondary data analysis. Um, so we link existing data sources such as the National Child Measurement Programme and Department for Education data sets such as the National Pupil Database. Um, so you know we don't use case studies, we're not collecting any primary or qualitative data, but we do see our evidence coming from the population of children of the right age groups in England as being complementary to the individual stories uh, we're hearing from uh, the other panelists. Much more detail on the methods, data sources, etc., can be found in our report, um, which is available online. So um, the problem with evaluating the universal infant free school meal scheme is that it was introduced in all of England in one go. So though there wasn't any form of natural experiments, there were no treatment groups or control groups. So for our main results, which is about the effects on body weight outcomes, it's worth taking a moment to discuss our method. So our strategy is based on comparing outcomes in the same school, but that was visited for measurement at different times of year in the pre and the post UIFSM years as well as controlling flexibly for other things that have changed within the school, such as the composition of its intake. And our principle is what's known in epidemiology and such like as a dose response effect. So the idea is that if we were going to see any effect of UIFSM, this would come through changing children's overall energy intake, probably from switching from packed lunch to school meals, possibly other changes uh, in their intake throughout the rest of the day if they're more satisfied. But we need a change in energy balance. Even if that happens consistently, we would still expect to see zero effect on body weight outcomes for children measured right at the start of the school year because they haven't had, um, they haven't been exposed to any change yet. And then we see diff we would expect to see differences emerge over subsequent weeks and months as children converge on a new set point or settling point for their body weight. And that is exactly what we found. So just plotting on these graphs are the treatment effects from our statistical models. And in summary, we found no difference in body weight outcomes uh, in the first half term of the school year, but significant differences afterwards. Uh, such that we estimate the effect of the universal infant free school meal program was to increase the prevalence of healthy weight by about one percentage point, reduce the prevalence of obesity by 0 0.7 percentage points, and reduce average body mass index by an amount that is equivalent to 60 to 65 grams in an average reception children child's body weight. So these are fairly small in absolute terms, but crucially, they are much bigger than any other school based intervention uh, that we reviewed as part of our policy, uh, as part of our research project. So who benefits? Well, intuitively, we would expect these results primarily to be driven by the not FSM eligible students, both because there's more of them and because a far greater proportion of them shifted their meal type as a result of the policy by about 50 percentage points. That said, the policy did also raise take up amongst harder to reach FSM eligible pupils by around three percentage points. And this was the case in schools, both with many and with few uh, FSM eligible pupils. But the effect of the policy on body weight outcomes does depend on the difference it makes to overall dietary intake. And in practice, we saw no benefits on average to children in schools with the very most and the very least affluent intakes as measured by registration rates for free school meals. So it it may well be the case that in the most advantaged schools, they already had pretty good packed lunches, while of course there's smaller scope to change take up rates in the least advantaged schools. And it's also possible that uh, financial savings are more likely to be spread over other people in the household if the 
household is more financially constrained in the first place. But it does seem that meal quality can be improved uh, even in relatively affluent households in the, this middle range of schools here. But it's important to take away that while the policy has improved body weight outcomes on average, it hasn't closed inequalities between the most and least advantaged areas. Um, and you know, health inequalities are an important uh, consideration here. One area where we have seen a big reduction in inequalities is between FSM eligible and not eligible pupils in their rates of absence from schools. So we used a different method for this. Uh, this was based on comparing changes in absence rates of infants and juniors in the same schools pre and post UIFSM. So this being the case where juniors aren't exposed to the policy, uh, but the infants are. Uh, so the effect size we find is that an FSM eligible pupil on average missed about one day less of school per year as a result of the policy. And about half of this effect was driven by illness and medical appointments, the rest for all other reasons. So it could be the case that going to school has become more attractive as more of their peers are taking up a school lunch. Uh, it could also be the case that um, there's a very large nutritional benefit to that small number of FSM eligible pupils who are persuaded to switch. So before I wrap up, just a couple of other considerations. Uh, the first is that we saw a small financial hit to schools from lower registrations for pupil premium. So this was about one and a half percentage points, fewer pupils registering uh, than we would predict had the policy not been introduced. So clearly investment in auto enrollment some local authorities have this, some don't. That's required to mitigate this. Also, we found evidence that UIFSM has crowded out take up of uh, school meals amongst FSM eligible children in older age groups. So there's definitely a cap capacity constraints issue. Uh, that is both potentially a threat to the persistence of the effects on body weight outcomes I've shown, for example, but more generally is a challenge to rolling out universal free school meals to older age groups unless the policy is properly resourced. So I'm pleased to say that uh, from here, Begita and I will soon be beginning a new research project also funded by the Nuffield Foundation uh, to evaluate the effects of local authority based universal free school meals such as that in Newham but also Islington, Southwark, Durham, Hull back in 2004 and this time we're going to look at uh, outcomes up to age 11. Uh, our main objective from this is to build evidence on how well the effects persist over time but also uh, to look at how the effects vary with the age at which children were first exposed to the free school, the universal programs, and the number of years they were exposed to it. Uh, we hope that by doing this, we can build the evidence base to design the most cost effective version of a universal free school meals policy. So, Nuffield has funded this project, but all these views are those of us and not of the foundation. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Angus. There's some interesting findings there, and certainly for me, they echo the experience that I've had on the ground. Um, again, please, uh, for all our participants who have joined us, please um, continue to um, ask any questions and answers, um, and we will come back to as many of them at the end of the session. Um, but for now, I'd like to introduce I'd you like to. to, introduce you to Laura Merkel, um, who is, sorry, there's an echo on the line, um, who, who is part of our a Scottish government to, to talk about the national policy perspective and the work that Scotland has been championing um, uh, as, a, as a nation. So uh, over to you, Laura. Hi, thank you very much. <clears throat> 
And thank you very much for the opportunity to um, join everyone today. Um, the, um, the, so the approach in Scotland um, is that, that we currently have a universal P1 to P3 um, commitment, which we've had in place since 2015, and it was announced um, in November last year that, that we would be the, the, the Scottish government intention was that we would be looking to have put in place a universal approach um, in primary schools, and and it's my own um, pleasure and responsibility, along with some of my colleagues and and indeed partners in um, local government and in in um, organisations externally, to to try to bring that um, commitment to fruition. Um, the commitment is that we will have universal um, primary uh, provision in place by August 2022, and that will apply to lunches, breakfasts. And we will also have in place um, free school meals during school holidays, um, the first of which actually began this week, um, which, which is quite timely. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how it came about. So, so I think people are interested in, you know, how did we make the case and, and, and such like. And I think one of the things that's probably quite important is to say that um, to some degree, the case has been made in Scotland around this type of issue for quite a long time. Um, we already have in place um, significant work around um, poverty-related attainment. Um, we have a, an, a, a, an approach called, called the um, Attainment Ch Challenge and the Pupil Equity Fund, which are about enabling um, children and young people to be able to access, fully access learning and, and to benefit from that. Um, so so the, that's the kind of context in which this, this came about, which, which means that um, Maybe slightly surprising to suggest that uh, ministers approached officials to um, think about this commitment and, and to bring it forward rather than officials having to make a significant case for this. And so to some, to some degree, the case is actually made in relation to other factors around um, poverty, attainment, all the things that have been discussed earlier on. Um, in terms of the advice that we gave to ministers, um, we highlighted four particular features um, to enable us to tackle inequality, support family budget, boost learning and attainment, and support children's health and well-being. And we've already discussed um, this, this afternoon the, the benefits of introducing good healthy eating habits, food education, um, and that you know those are very, very positive benefits in and of themselves. There, there's a wider pattern um, to this piece of work at the moment that we are currently in, we have just gone through an election in Scotland and so we are currently introducing a number of changes which are about um, other costs of learning in Scotland so um, there will be um, funding coming forward to support a change in costs on instrumental music tuition, curriculum charges, we are also increase, increasing the level of um, clothing grants and so this work sits in, in amongst a much wider commitment. The, these approaches are partnership approaches. It would be fair to say that the first thing that, that my colleagues and I did when we were asked by ministers to consider this was to be in touch with our local government association, um, COSLA, and um, the Association of Directors of Education, but also assist them and um, APSE to discuss whether or not how, how this might be delivered realistically in Scotland. Um, and so we have a phased approach to implementation um, with the primary four commitment beginning in August and um, primary five coming from January next year. And we will then look for primary six and primary seven across um, for August 2022. Um, it's, a, it's a significant commitment for us to try to deliver um, and that we have um, budgeted at the moment two hundred and thirty million pounds for the three commitments, um, but we know that that doesn't actually cost so that doesn't include some of the infrastructure costs, and so we still have work to do on some of that as we move forward over the course of the next year, and so it's going to be quite a challenging time for us all. But the key feature I think for us is that we've been doing our work so far in partnership, and we will continue to do that. The challenges are that are before us, of course, are about um, the fact that, that we have to deliver such a significant commitment in a relatively short time period. 
Um, one of the things that's really important to us is that we continue to maintain quality. We have um, significant work done already in Scotland on food standards and that that needs to continue and needs, it, needs, it aligns with this frame, this development and we need to bring that through. Um, in terms of support, support for expansion, we, we're going to have, because Scotland is small, um, we are going to have a joint governance arrangement with ourselves and local authorities so that our, our partnership approach continues um, and it continues through into our governance and accountability so that we're, where we identify challenges, so, you know, for example, we will certainly not have all of the spaces in schools that we need in order to be able to feed children and young people so we can tackle that jointly and think about, think that through. We have got funding in place for certainly the first year of um, this commitment and, and one of our tasks is to get the funding in place beyond that, which we will do. In terms of monitoring and evaluation, we have arrangements in place at the moment to consider um, the uptake and, and at the moment in our P1 to P3 we have 75% uptake, um, otherwise we've got 53%, so we, we've got, you know, we've got a lot of capacity to bring um, in the next short year or 14 months. Um, in terms, but in terms of monitoring and evaluation, we, we are able to, to consider um, uptake and things like that. But I think in terms of getting that evidence around what are the changes to children and young people's outcomes, we will need to consider a completely different way of evaluating that. And I think, you know, we may end up with another work that we do, we, we're using research um, approaches for, the, for that. So I think we're, we're at, in summary, we're, we're probably at the beginning of quite a big journey for us. Um, we continue to keep under um, review all of our entitlements, um, in any case, anyway, and we will continue to do so, um, recognising obviously that, that uh, naturally is one of the things that, that is um, around for us, it, it, certainly in Scotland, it will be elsewhere, is that having, having go, gone for the universal primary equipment, we have we are obviously asked to then to consider secondary um, and I think one of the one of the challenges for us is that capacity point and the fact that, that we need to um, be able to um, work our way through that it would be a much bigger change that, than the change that we have already been asked to make um, in Scotland but it's a piece of work that that we are certainly working our way through um, and we will continue to do that over the next 14-ish months. Um, I'll wrap up there and, and allow time for questions. I recognise people will want to maybe delve into some of those issues a bit further. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, absolutely fantastic that the work that you're championing there. Um, so we are um, I'm moving on to our opportunities for questions and discussion, really. So um, before we before we do, I wanted to invite um, any comments from uh, others, other young people in our audience uh, who might have um, uh, strong feelings or opinions about what's been discussed? Um, Miles Bramner, I know that you might have had some uh, some feedback that we've not been able to come back to, so feel free to to jump in here and and uh, invite uh, invite your conversation. Is there anyone that would like to start off? Are there any other schools uh, on online that would like to make a comment? Any other local authorities? <laughs> okay, well, maybe this gives us a bit more of an opportunity to go back to some of the questions that um, that were raised earlier. So. Um, I'd like to go back to Peter's question. Um, for Andy um, around uh, the term universal. So I'll just read out his question. So is the term universal the right word for what is required to address the issue? There's been a significant rise in eligibility over the past few months from 1.4 million to 1.8. Um, many more will be living with food insecurity and not be able to claim. The system needs to recognize this and in the USA, there have a system whereby if 50% of the school community is eligible for free school meals, the funding is there for all. This is a targeted approach in areas where it is needed. 
This would uh, mitigate the stigma. Funding, as now, could be given through delegated funding. There is also a tiered approach to paid meals, full and part-time. So, so if a family can afford to pay, they do. This is a national issue. And whilst in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, school catering is still mainly provided by, via the local authorities. In England, this approach and landscape has varied. And as catering services have been affected through delegated powers, tendering, etc., etc. Ultimately, the quality has to be the driver. Checks and balances need to be in place to ensure value and improvement. So, Andy, would you like to come in there and... and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to break that question down into bits if, uh, if that's OK. So I think the first thing around the term universal, I think when I think about that in Newham, when we think about that, first of all, we think about it universal as in includes all people. But, but I hope as I've, I've tried to make clear in my slide, we need to include all things here. Um, it's absolutely impossible to talk about school meals without recognising that we have huge health and wellbeing issues. And, you know, that question sort of touches on ideas of really important ideas about government funding for areas that are most in need. And, and I'd say, well, yes, if that's the journey we're on, that idea of if your borough like my borough has huge need and you are already near a threshold. And let's bear in mind that any kind of threshold of this nature is arbitrary and where it cuts. So 50 percent of what and what threshold would be the obvious comparative question with America versus where we're currently setting, for example, our bar for free school meals, which is not a very high bar, is it? You know, lots of you who deal with this issue day to day will talk about the limbo underneath you need to be eligible for a free school meal. So, yes, if we're talking about more government funding for areas where action is most needed, I'd say yes. Um, I think when we get to things like a tiered approach and breaking down, well, should some parents pay and other parents we start to get back to that thing that education professionals who are, are in the field are probably best placed to talk about. We have huge challenges here that cost us lots and lots of money. And I go back to the idea of literacy. And I go back to the idea of two thirds of adults not at a healthy weight. And I could pick another health challenge related to food like mental health, or I could pick another challenge like dementia and Alzheimer's, something that costs us 26 billion pounds a year and has a massive dietary and food component. And we're talking about something where to extend this at key stage two is 900 million pounds a year versus just if I take one of those health challenges, 26 billion pounds. If we think about obesity, it's a six billion pound a year challenge. And I think the question then comes, when we talk about value for money and making an intervention and thinking about the economics of this, do we not need to just cut straight to the chase, which is schools are our best place to bring through a generation that has a healthy relationship with food. And we've done it in maths. We've done it with literacy. We dance on the head of a pin about whether we're better or worse these days at maths than South Korea. And yet we have two thirds of our adults not at a healthy weight. We have a 26 billion pound a year cost in older age care that could be preventable for generations coming through or are certainly reducible. And that's when you start asking the question, do we want to dance around with things that take a lot to administer or do we want to give schools the money and the time and an hour in the day to tackle some of these big and very expensive problems? Does that Sort of cover most of it off it was quite a big question i think it's uh, thank you for that very thanks andy for that detailed re response i think it's cover uh, most of the answers but if if peter if you have any further questions please feel free to to um pop that in the chat um so we so we've uh, um also got lots of conversation coming through um Barbara, you've also mentioned um, distinguishing the benefits between universal for free schools meals, I think, and, um, and PA and the reduced sedentary activity of children returning to school and the BMI and the healthy and healthy weight percentages and how that improves. Do you, um, would anyone, any of the panellists like to come in and respond to Barbara's question there? Well, I, I would comment that, um, you know, already uh, children's body weights are observed to decline over the course of the school year and uh, apparently revert in, in holidays. You know, our results are that universal free school meals are an enhancement to that beneficial effect of the school environment. As... So as, as you describe, it's really about um, 
you know the environment being conducive to to a healthy a healthy weight and promoting as we do in all our educational aspects um you know a good normalization of good food and a healthy food culture across the board um Thank you, um, Angus. Um, so we also have another question uh, talking about secondary schools and key stage two and three. Um, Miles, you've mentioned that you'd be happy to come in. Uh, would you like to uh, take the floor? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's been great listening to the presentations of the real day-to-day -day impact um, of a universal school meal provision as, as we've seen in uh, the London boroughs, as, as well as the very persuasive, um, simple arguments that you, you have put across, Andy, around why wouldn't we do this? Um, and I think what we all have an opportunity to think about is how to frame the um, arguments that are put forward of why, you know, universal school meals are a good thing um, to presenting that in a well why wouldn't you just do that and I think for me one of the opportunities we've had perhaps a challenge is that you know we we're going to find it very difficult to totally prove the longitudinal impact of uh, the cost benefit of universal school meals for a start as soon as you start piling together so many different um, benefits around health, attainment, income, sustainability, local jobs, you're, you're, you're creating lots of different arguments, which then when they come together can seem slightly complicated. You then have lots of different stakeholders to speak to, whereas currently central government it's only one department education that actually funds funds the policy and so i think we i think as a as a sector we have an opportunity to be confident about the evidence base be clear about the the theory of change or the journey about seeing the day-to-day -day impact of what a universal policy gives us for our children they're not going hungry they're socializing together they're learning together um, and, and so on. Um, back that up with the academic data that Angus and other brilliant people, people are doing and draw on the experiences um, that Laura has in Scotland and Andy has in Newham with your councillors about what it was that just were the catalysts about framing the argument about why wouldn't we just do this? Um, but but we have a challenge on our hands, I think, to to really be able to um, do that. But I'm confident that we will. If we look back over the last sort of decade, we see at each uh, political cycle in different nations, more and more sort of foundations of uh, different political parties or different groups, cohorts of people you know, making that universal decision. Um, so I think we've got, you know, we've, we're climbing that mountain, although I still think we need to frame uh, that narrative slightly differently. Um, on secondary schools, I was just gonna come in and say, you know, in Newham, it's a really big thing. It's the what next. So I think the really important thing in all of this is don't get sucked into what about a read. So at a local government level, more than anywhere else, we really do look at the idea of finite non-statutory budgets. And we get together every year, and we make the case for everything. And when you look at the case for this, it has survived and it has survived for good reason in the face of some incredibly good scrutiny from members, some incredibly good um, you know, review from a, an excellent panel of people with a really 360 degree view on the world. Now, when it comes to secondary schools, we've got an opportunity there to build on this in Newham, and we have an opportunity to build nationally, recognising that it's not just about the free meal, is it? It's about what comes with that. And to go back to that slide and everything else, we have huge challenges and huge opportunities. It's certainly something we're looking at and we're working now with secondary schools to, uh, to build. But the really key thing for us is to not have that conversation in the context of what about whatabouttery, what about this instead of that. 
but recognizing we're on a big journey to solve some big problems and secondary schools are next. Um, you know, in the same way that we have a whole systems approach to healthy weight, uh, you know, secondary schools are next, uh, but not instead of, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's a conversation really ideally about going all the way through to at least key stage four, isn't it? And thinking of this as just a natural part of the journey as they do in other countries that have a, an approach to food that, that is universal. Yeah, thanks, Andy. So as you say, we, we we are building a generation for the future to to have good, healthy habits, and and not to only that, conscious consumers for the future. And and as it has been raised um, by a member, one of our attendees, this is a, a moral case too. Schools are communities that need to challenge the social inequalities that mark the UK society, and not to reinforce it. And, participation in nutritious meals at the middle of the day should be a right of every child and as Jeanette points out we should maybe we should start looking at dropping the word free it's an entitlement um, as part of a child's life as as Katie Morris has also um, mentioned that this is 14 years of a child's life um, in education so the learning that they get through food not just a meal in the middle of the day is, is a foundation for life. Um, we have also had the Just Change campaign who've um, mentioned here as providing clear evidence of empowering young people. Um, so there's no negative consequences in terms of dietary intake, but it's all about education. Um, coming through to the questions. Um, are we also have in Scotland that there's a phase model in order to make commitments deliverable and that with a clear message to all partners? There are a, a number of, you know, um, there's a lot of strength in the arguments that have been made today. Uh, yeah, I wonder, um, mentioned earlier about families, uh, Kate also mentioned helping families to create great meals at home. Does anybody want to come in with that, um, you know, the, the wider benefits to the community of free school meals or school meals in general. Okay, let's go back to some of the other questions. Um, we have a question from uh, Ian, um, Iana Simpson, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Um, it would be good to know how Andy's team calculated the social impact and community wealth building as a really great way of highlighting the broader economic benefits of universal infant free school meals. Um, yeah, like fairly straightforward, really. If you move from 45% um, take up to 90 something percent take up, you are massively increasing the number of meals that are being cooked. And, and eaten each day. You're therefore massively increasing the workforce around them that directly delivers those. You're increasing the work done by your local suppliers that provide your fruit and veg and um, other services. Um, you know, maybe at the, the, the more nuanced end, you're increasing the amount of uh, plates you have to clean and, and people you employ then as you, you, you work that down. And then you get into a, a place where when you multiply that across 66 schools, you start to look at something that is really growing in size as an industry. And then of course, if you compare that to how kids will be getting lunch without, um, without your school meals program, packed lunch industry happens in the ether far away, you know, in, in factories and, and processing plants and largely places that are delivering us food that is high fats and in high in fat salts and sugar and low in local skilled labor and the interactions that come with school meals. And so then you build out from there to an idea of, right, what does my borough look like if a lot less children are eating those meals? Now, the other end of the spectrum for us is if we could take, take up in the same direction again at secondary school, because we see as soon as that universal program drops off between year six and year seven, we see a big drop in take up. So then the question for us is, wow, imagine if we could replicate that again for these seven years of secondary school and, and college. And what that means in terms of great local jobs, rewarding careers. And it's not just the kids, is it? It's the people that work in that industry and take what they know back out into their communities as champions. We talk a lot in you about champions, those of you who are aware of our champions program. Talk about champions, but go back into the community as champions of good food with professional expertise that, that lives in the borough. Um, you know, it's already around about a thousand jobs in a borough of 365,000 people. You know, if you, if you took this up a notch at secondary school, you'd be looking at, 
you know, close to the same again, wouldn't you? So, yeah, pretty significant industry. And, and it's all based on whether children are eating a meal that you've cooked in the borough or eating something that you've manufactured elsewhere. Absolutely. And, and it's worthwhile, uh, you know, reflecting on the sustainable food places model that really generates uh, local food for local people and, and supporting the local economy. And not to mention that all the work that we are passionately delivering on a day to day basis is supporting the sustainable development goals uh, uh, internationally. Um, I'd just like to bring in Laura, who'd like who's able to respond to a, a question earlier around Scotland. Laura, would you like to come in? There's been a couple in the chat which I've um, which I've responded to in writing, but I think that one of the questions was about do we fully understand yet the the infrastructure cost? And the answer is no, not at the moment. That um, we have, as a, you know, as I said, we're we're, on, we're in a middle of a at the beginning of a journey, um, and we so we know what some of the costs are, but we don't know them all yet, um, and that's the next. Um, task for our joint governance um, group is to, to, to begin to unpick that. Um, I think, as I said, the, um, the, the advantage that I have um, is that Scotland is small. Um, I think that one of the other questions um, touches on the fact that we have 32 local authorities in Scotland. I think England has 152. Um, and so um, right now I'm feeling quite pleased to be sitting in Scotland to try to do this. Um, I think the but I think the thing that, that we've been able to do is to work in partnership from the very, very outset. And so one of the some of the issues around infrastructure and, um, you know, the, the fact that we need capacity, we need to make sure spaces are good places for, for children and young people to eat. Um, we've known right from the outset because of the partnership approach that we've taken, and it therefore gives us an opportunity to consider those um, and to think about it. So that was that was those two points, really if that is helpful. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'd just like to uh, come back to also Greta's question here around um, the consideration around uh, brain development, which is uh, something I wonder if um, Andy could uh, come back to that around uh, the effects of um, food on brain development that continues up until the age of 21. Um, so obviously there's a as it's stated here, is a clear um, argument for the extension of um, uh, school meals across the board, um, otherwise of the inequality factor. Um, would, would our panellists like to come in and comment on that from their experience? Only to say from a new point of view that, um, yeah, that's exactly the argument that's central to our thinking. You cannot find a health argument where the answer is, well, if we feed these children worse, it'll be fine or they'll do even better. You know, there's, there's no argument analogous to the football one that if we don't let them have the ball in training, they'll be hungry when it comes to matches. There isn't anything here that works in the field other than to say, if you feed children well, they will do better and be less costly to you later on on every measure, really, isn't it? Every single thing we have points back in this direction. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I see Ed, uh, you have your hand. Would you like to come in? Um, yeah, just um, just briefly. Um, so I'm a policy and parliamentary officer for CPAG in Scotland, and um, we've obviously been uh, lobbying hard, uh, Laura and her colleagues. Um, I'd, I'd like to take credit for um, having free school meals in Scotland, but it was nothing to do with me. The announcement came a week I took him a post, so it was my predecessors. But I know um, John Dickey, the, the director of CPAG in Scotland, it has been sort of pushing on this for 20 years. So it's a long process. Make sure you've got your arguments, you've got your strategy, lobby the people and you can change the narrative. And the narrative in Scotland has changed, as, as Laura was saying, putting children first um, and making sure there is funding available for, um, for free school meals. And it's wrapped up for us in part of our border cost of the school day project, which Laura kind of touched on. It's, it's not just about free school meals, it's about the other costs of schools. Um, and as, as, as Andy was kind of saying, we're, um, we're certainly going to keep pushing um, universal free school meals for high school children next, um, Laura, if that's all right. <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll keep pushing. Uh, 
uh, pushing on that. Um, I guess one thing that's interesting to think about and which I picked up on Angus and Bridget's um, paper is the drop off in applications for free school meals when you're using free school meals as a proxy indicator for poverty in schools. Um, and obviously, to begin with, that drop off is relatively small. But what happens over time when, when free school meals are no longer a thing, it's just school meals? What do you use as that proxy indicator? Um, and how do you target um, support for low income households, uh, clothing grants, um, uh, help during the, the holidays with, with um, food, those kind of things? How do you identify those low income households um, if we're not going to use uh, free school meals? And how also do we measure the, the poverty in schools? As, as uh, Rima, your, your um, presentation, you, know, you, you knew that you have a high level of poverty in the school from free school meal applications, um, and we need that information. So, is it about continuing to have a kind of system of people applying for free school meals, even though free school meals exist? Or do we start looking at some different alternatives? Um, but then there's obviously an argument about what they are and who benefits and who loses. So um, that's why, but I guess, um, yeah, keep hammering that message home to those policymakers that we need free school meals and it does eventually pay off. Absolutely, let's keep, let's keep having the conversation and making changes as we go forward. So as we, um, as we come to the close of this event, I wondered if we, it'd be good to um, have final thoughts from all of our panellists. So if I could go back to Rima G. Uh, Reed at Hollydale School, would you like to come in with your final thoughts? For me, really interesting. Thank you for inviting me. Um, one of the things to me is about how the different communities that we have in Boroughs, like the London Borough Southern, we've got to get those parents on board um, and so, for example, at Hollydale, we do taste the day so those parents can see the food that's being offered to their children. A lot more work needs to be done with parents. We could do all this work in school, but if they go home and they have chicken and chips, which I know a lot of my, you know, they need to understand the value of this food that will, that, that impacts on brain function. So a lot more work needs to be done with the actual communities. The communities in Newham and Suffolk are very vast, very different. Do we really understand what they know about food and how that impacts on what's going on with the work that we're doing. So, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with all of you because it is really exciting and thank you. Thank you, Rima. Yes, it, it is about extending the good work that we do. It's not just in schools. This is a this is a community driven approach. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, quick words from Andy. Um, yeah, just to say, look, we have something that represents great value for money in Newham. And to sort of answer a question with a final thought, um, is this about individual local authorities paying for schemes or lobbying government to make this central to education? It's very much the latter. We need to recognise what we need now across a range of issues and ask government to fund it and to fund it because it will pay them back, because it will level it up in, in one political language, because it will community wealth build in another, but because it will pay us back. It is the greatest investment we can make now. And it's probably two things. It's probably the literacy of our, our century when we look back. And I think this moment in time is probably our beverage moment. You know, none of us were around for the first beverage moment. But I think when we look back on this pandemic, this moment now is perhaps our beverage moment to make a change that shapes two, three, four generations to come. And I think food and schools is that moment. Brilliant, thank you. Can't agree more. Birgit and, Birgit and Angus, um, would you like to come in and, and share your final thoughts? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so, you know, our main finding is universal infant free school meals reduce obesity at the end of the first year of school. Obesity is so hard to shift. Uh, we certainly need to do more work on how it persists and we will. But, you know, even if we just delay the onset of obesity, we're still producing a benefit in terms of reduced morbidities later in life. Absolutely, this is it's imperative work to, to prevent problems uh, stacking up for the future for our children. Um, Laura, would you like to come in um, would you like and to come in, share your thoughts? Thank you again for the opportunity to, to join um, and really, really great to hear actually all the different perspectives. All A lot of the information is the same as, as we've been going through and experiencing here and thinking about here. So um, that's been really, really reassuring. And uh, I'm sure we'll all stay in touch as, as I crack on through this lovely journey. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laura. Um, um, and finally, Miles, would you like to come in and, and share any final thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, an amazing session. And I think to bring together lived experience uh, together with, you know, all the way up through to national policy um, has been really important. I, I think as we move forward, hone our arguments. We need to remember we need to be persuasive to policymakers. We need to be persuasive to educational leaders because they're, they're the people who are going to make it happen. Um, and then, as we also heard Rena say, we, we've got to be persuasive for parents and children because they're, they're the customers uh, for our school food. And just because a meal is you know, provided free doesn't always mean that it's uh, wanted or taken. Um, so in order to prove Andy's great point of the, the value for money around provision of school meals, we need to convince both the educational world and parents and children that uh, good school food matters. Thank you, Miles. Yes, this is an absolute cultural change we need to be championing and we do need our passion. And as you said before, we also need the evidence to back it up. So we are reaching the right audiences and the right language to engage uh, the, the multiple voices in the arena. I'd just like to close the event for today. I, uh, and a big thank you to all of our panellists for your inspiring and inspirational um, and revealing conversations and talks for today and also the fantastic sustain team who have brought together the event um, and uh, our great panel for today um, before i close would uh, barbara like to come in and say any final words oh of course i should also mention that there is a survey that is um that barbara has put into the chat please feel free to well please do complete it it'll be insightful for our um to, to capture your voices um from today's session over to you, Barbara. Uh, thank, thank you, Raksha. And just want to say a big thank you to you for chairing this session and jumping into the hot seat, as it were. Um, and I, I think I'm really struck by what Beth said right at the very start about this being a moment in time uh, in terms of building back better and the COVID recovery agenda. Um, and that we, we do have these twin crises of food insecurity and of um, a health, building a healthy relationship with food. I really like that framing by Angus. And I think we could get sucked into a lot of whataboutery um, if we're not careful. But I think there is there is a, a moment in time here, a moment in history where we're talking about building back better. And I really hope we can continue to have uh, this conversation and to keep keeping our eyes on the big vision ahead um, and where we're trying to get to it, it, it ultimately. And I, I'm always really struck that, you know, when... When, when our children go into hospital, nobody means test them. When our children step into school, nobody means test them before giving them a chair um, or, or opening a door into the classroom. Um, but we do means test them with food. When we, um, when we launched our big vaccination drive, it wasn't free at the point of use, only if you could afford it. So I think when, when we have big um, social um, and cultural and health related issues, uh, I think uh, we, and, and, and inclusion issues to address, I think it's time for big, bold ideas. And I think that's, that's the thought that, um, so whilst we're still lobbying for those changes and making sure that at the very least we get more eligibility for more children um, as fast as we can, um, I think we should keep that big vision alive. So thank you very much. Hopefully when I close this webinar, a little, Thing will pop up in your window with a link to a survey. I will send it out along with the recording and the presentations uh, that you've heard today. And uh, just want to add my thanks to everybody, to all the organisations who um, supported me in bringing this webinar together um, and for all our speakers as well. So thank you.